again, we're going to look at this passage from uh, First Peter. And without further ado, I suppose we, we should just read it, huh? Let's, let's, let's read it. Let's get into this together. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. These are your holy words. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Praise be to God. Lord, we just come humbly before you right now, and we just thank you so much for this extraordinary passage of Scripture, so rich and so deep. I pray, Lord, that we would be changed by it. We, we have come here, Lord, this morning to be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit, to be transformed by the power of your word. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that your word would speak to us this morning and that our hearts would be open to receive the fullness of your word. Be with us, Lord Jesus. Be with us, Holy Spirit. Be with, be with us, Heavenly Father. Amen. So looking at verse 18, here we go. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Christ suffered for sins. In fact, we all suffer for sins to some degree. The difference with Christ is, is that he's not suffering for his own sins. Christ never sinned. Christ is suffering for our sake, or suffered rather, for our sake. And that's why he went to the cross, was to suffer for our sins. He is righteous, we are unrighteous. 1 Corinthians chapter excuse me, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus had no sin within him, but he died for us. He became our sin on the cross. Now just think about that for a moment. He who knew no sin became our sin on the cross. And just briefly think about your life and all the things that you've done. Jesus Christ on the cross took that sin upon himself. And the wrath of God was poured out on him instead of us. That's the understanding here. Now it says once and for all. Jesus Christ suffered for our sin on the cross once and for all. Jesus stepped into a sacrificial system that was continually sacrificing animals. That was pointing to Jesus who would be the ultimate sacrifice for all of humanity. In Leviticus chapter 16, it's an interesting passage. It deals with the day of atonement. And instructions are given for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It uh, takes place at the time of fall. And um, two goats are selected. You probably know this, but if you don't, this is, this is what's kind of going on here. Two goats are selected that are unblemished. Then lots are cast. And one goat is chosen by lot. To be sacrificed in the temple. That goat is going to be sacrificed unto God. As a sin offering. On behalf of the people. A sin offering was to bring about purity. The other goat. Doesn't have it any better off. <laughs> this goat is going to be. The scapegoat. This is where we get that in our 
society, you hear about the scapegoat. Oh, so-and-so became the scapegoat. You've got to blame somebody. Okay. The scapegoat in ancient Israel, according to, he, uh, according to Leviticus chapter 16, the priest would go to the scapegoat and place his hands on the head of the scapegoat <clears throat> and symbolically place the sins of the people on the goat's head. That goat then was let loose out into the wild, given to something called Azazel, which probably was the devil, the spirit of the desert. This goat would be torn up by wild animals and eaten. In a sense, giving the devil back his sin and giving God the goat to bring forth purity. The perfect goat that is sinless. Jesus Christ died for our sin once and for all and became both goats. He became the bull too that's also sacrificed on the same day. He became, he stepped into that entire sacrificial system and shut it down. Once and for all. Amen? We don't have to do this any longer because Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews 9.26 says, He has appeared once, for, once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. How is that? That is so amazing. He is the priest and he is also the sacrifice. That's what Peter's referring to here. A lot going on here, huh? This is only the beginning. I warn you. That he might bring us to God. Verse 18 continues. So, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This is one sentence in the Greek. And that's why you've got one sentence in the ESV and it's just comma, 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 comma. It's just really long. If you wrote a sentence like this, if I wrote a sentence like this in college, I would have been in trouble. But the biblical authors could get away with it. That he might bring us to God. That's the goal. Why did Jesus come? Why did he seek to forgive us of our sins? To bring us to God. That's it. To bring us back. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They ran from God. They hid themselves. God came after them. He found them. He killed an animal. He clothed them in the animal's skins. Through the cross, we are in a sense clothed in the skin of Christ. He is our righteousness. We put on Christ. God wants to bring us back to him through Jesus Christ. John 12, 32 and 33 says, And I, this is Jesus speaking, And I, Jesus, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. When Jesus was raised up on the cross, the ultimate sacrifice for all people, not just some, not just you, not just me, but the whole world, drawing all people to himself as the ultimate sacrifice. Being put to death in the flesh, verse 18 continues, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is a reference to Christ. Christ is put to death in the flesh. Jesus is put to death in the flesh. He was a human being. He was an actual man. He was also divine, but let's not forget about his manhood, his personhood. He was an actual human being put to death. Now, there was a heresy at this time, and it was... Um, it was created and, and put forth by the Gnostics. And that was is that Jesus merely looked like he died on the cross. In the Quran, it says, in fact, they picked up this same heresy in Islam. Um, they talk about Jesus on the cross, but in a sense, it's not really him. It's somebody else who's crucified. Jesus really never died on the cross is what they're going to say. No, Jesus died in the flesh on the cross. He did die for you and me. But he was raised in the spirit. What does that mean? Good question. Thought you'd ask. 
it probably refers to the period of time between, I, this is what I think, between Jesus' death and physical bodily resurrection. So in a sense, Jesus, he, he is put to death in the body. And that's not in a sense. That's truly the case. But then he's, he's in a sense raised spiritually. So that he's, he's able to be, right? I mean, he exists. He's not totally dead. He's, this is not soul sleep. I mean, like he's able to move around spiritually. This understanding also mirrors what happens to us when we die in Christ. When we die in Christ, our body is killed. Our spirit goes to be with the Lord. And then on the day of resurrection, our body is reunited with our spirit. And we are raised to life physically. So that's what I think is referring here. So here's Jesus. He's this disembodied spirit. Because he really didn't die. He didn't die in his spirit. Just his body died. And then verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. So here he is, here's Jesus spiritually before he is risen from the dead, before he takes a seat beside the father to rule and reign, which is where Peter's going to go with this passage. He descends into this underworld place. He's descending to a place where spirits are being held in chains. Two questions. Who are these spirits and what is Jesus proclaiming to them? That's what I want to know. Does anybody know? <laughs> okay. Here's what I think. And I think it's, it might sound a little strange to some of your ears. But it's not my problem. Because I think it's scripture. In fact, I know it's scripture. I don't know any other way to interpret this truly. And people have tried. But this is the way it is to be interpreted, I believe, very strongly because of other texts. Peter here references the days of Noah. And he references these spirits that are being held in chains. I think what Peter is talking about here are spirit beings. He's not talking about people. He's not talking about disembodied human beings that are being held for the day of judgment. He's talking about spirits that actually, in Genesis chapter 6, descended from heaven. Descended from where God dwells, but fell. Possibly angelic beings. For example, Jude chapter 6 Excuse me, verse 6, there are no chapters in Jude, but Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling right in heaven, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. These are angelic beings or yeah, angel is kind of just a placeholder name. It's sort of a, I mean, you can throw a lot of things into the, the name of angel. It means messenger, but it also refers to spirits that, you know, may not necessarily be angels. And I can't get too much into this, but this is where questions might start to arise. And we can talk about this after, I can't meet with you right after the service, but next, you know, this next week or something, if you want to chat about this, please give me a call and I will go much, much, I could talk about this for an hour. But in the days of Noah, right before the flood, Spirit beings descended, and they were called the sons of God, and they descended, because that was a name for them. They descended, and they saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they had relations with them, if you know what I mean. And from them were born the Niflim, the sons of Anak, a race of giants. David would battle one named Goliath. Just saying. It's fascinating. Fascinating stuff. We'll put all of that aside for now. This is where Jesus is going. He's going down to these, these spirit beings that had sinned in a way that was so profane and blasphemous to God that he locked them up specifically. 
Jude talks about it. Genesis chapter 6 talks about it. And Peter's referring to it. I don't see any other way to interpret this passage. So now we ask ourselves, what is he proclaiming? What's he saying to these spirits? Some people have suggested, well, you know, he descended so that he could go share with them the gospel. I don't think so. I don't think so. Not from the context of this passage. <clears throat> if you look at verse 22, and we're going to eventually get there, but I don't want to jump there yet. But let's just take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. <clears throat> it says in verse 20, God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to be the church or to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus Christ went and proclaimed to these blasphemous spirits that left their heavenly abode to do something very, very, very evil and wicked. And Jesus proclaimed to them, I am victor. I have won. I have conquered all evil. The sins of the world I have conquered. And I have conquered you. That's what I think he's saying to these spirits. It's a pro proclamation of divine judgment and why they're being held probably still being held today, waiting for the final judgment of God, the white throne judgment. So, Peter continues here. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were being brought safely through the water, or safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And this is where we get the title on our bulletin this morning. <clears throat> Another deep area. Okay, ready? Here we go. <laughs> Get on your bathing suit. We're going to just dive in. Kaboosh. I'm going to go in cannonball. So, this is the context. Now, what's interesting here is that Peter is now shifting a little bit here, but he's still, he really wants us to remember the days of Noah. The days of Noah, why are they so important? Think, think about Matthew 24. When Jesus says, and just like in the days of Noah, one will be taken, the other one left, right? I mean, the days of Noah are a big deal to Jesus, to Peter here, to the early Christians. The days of Noah. Because the days of Noah speak of judgment. It is the judgment of Almighty God. And God uses what to judge, what to wash away, what to cleanse the world of sin, water. He uses water. In the Old Testament, God has given us symbols. He's given us understandings that refer to things in the future. And we call this typology. Big word, but there are types in the Old Testament and anti-types in the New. Now, I'm a printer by trade. I understand this language really well. I get it. A plate is like the type, and then it goes to the blanket, the anti-type, and then prints onto the actual printed paper. I get it. I know what's going on here. That's how it works. It's, it's ref a reference to type, like printing type. So anyway, in the Old Testament, you have these stories, like, for example, the flood. And we take the flood and we kind of go, oh, I know what that means. That's when Noah was, you know, he and the ark and they, you know, and they were raised up above the waters and God judged the world of sin and all this stuff. And then we just sort of compartmentalize it. And we keep it there. But that is pointing to something in the future, just like the entire sacrificial system that I was just talking about. Remember the scapegoats or the scapegoat and the other goat to be sacrificed? That is also pointing to the future. That is a type and it's pointing to an anti-type, and that anti-type is Jesus. I don't want to lose anybody here. I'm, I'm sorry for the technicality here, but we've got to understand this. Otherwise, we won't understand these New Testament writers. There are stories, symbols in the Old Testament that are basically providing images of things, mysteriously, of things that will take place in the future. Wow, a little bell just dinged. 
That was really cool. <laughs> so anyway, you can see, I mean, you know, yeah, every time a bell rings, an angel gets, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, goodness, that's not right. That's terrible theology, by the way. Um, Angels don't even have wings. I mean, come on. No. All right. So um, <clears throat> look at Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, now just, just this is another example, and I just want to draw this in. This, this is the kind of stuff I really get excited about. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. Okay, what's he referring to here? What's this cloud? This is the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud or a pillar of smoke, by day. And this cloud was leading them. And they were under this cloud. The cloud protected them from the Egyptians before he opened the waters. You can read all about it. It's fascinating. Just so amazing. So he says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, right? I mean, when the, when the Israelites walked through on dry land, they passed through the sea, right? They're passing through the sea. Another reference to water. And all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Oh my goodness. So Paul is seeing the greatest story of redemption in the Old Testament as pointing to baptism. It was, it was a kind of baptism. They were baptized into Moses. Well, now we are baptized into Christ, aren't we? How does that happen? Well, through baptism. And that's what, that's what Paul's talking about here. So... Peter is doing exactly what Paul's doing. And he's looking at a happening in the Old Testament. And he's saying that this refers to this. And so when we think about that for a moment, just think about this ark. The ark was lifted up off of the earth by the waters underneath it that were washing away all the sin. Okay, now, now think about the Israelites passing through the Red Sea. Who was pursuing them? Their past. Their past life. <laughs> the Egyptians. They wanted to kill them. The biggest army probably that was on earth at that time was pursuing them. And God drew them into the water. Got the Israelites safely on the other side. Right? And then Moses dropped his staff and the waters went <laughs> And washed away all that evil. Baptism. The flood washed away all that evil. And here's baptism. God is using baptism to wash away evil. The past. That which is at our heels. Baptism is washing that away. And that's why Peter makes the point Baptism, which corresponds to these happenings in the Old Testament, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body. Full stop. Okay, what does that mean? Baptism is not outward. It's when I, when I baptize somebody, I'm not whipping out a bottle of shampoo and going, well, we're just going to wash their hair, you know, and... You know, I mean, I'm not trying to wash them outwardly. I'm merely giving them a flood. <laughs> I'm merely bringing them safely through the waters. And God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is washing away their past life, their sins. And that's why Peter is so bold to talk about this. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, it says, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now, baptism has definitely divided the church. Church has had a lot of issues on baptism. Some people say well, it's just a symbol And other people say, nah, I think it's something more than a symbol. What do you think? 
It's just a symbol. Is that what Peter's saying? I mean, I just, we can talk about it sometime, but there's something, something going on here. It appears that Peter saw baptism as something a little bit more than a symbol, perhaps a lot more than a symbol. Something deep going on here. Something like the Israelites crossing through the Red Sea kind of thing. Something like the flood of the entire world washing away humanity that had fallen into a kind of wickedness that God had to wash away. Peter continues, but as an appeal to God for for a good conscience. So he says, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. This is really difficult Greek here, just letting you know, and uh, I'm not going to get into it too much, but what I think is being said here is that when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit is given to us, and the Spirit begins to convict our heart of sin, and begins to awaken our conscious, our, you know, our consciousness, or makes us conscious, conscience. Anyway, awakens our conscience, is what I'm trying to say, to sin, and sort of makes us conscious of sin too. Um, the words are funny. But anyway, the point of it is, is that we become aware of our sinfulness as we grow in Christ, as the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts. And I think that that's probably what is going on here is that we want a good conscience before God, right? We get convicted and we say, no, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I want to walk with you, Jesus. Oh God, forgive me of my sins. Like we were just confessing our sins when I opened us up with prayer. We confess our sins to God. We want to be right with God. We want to have a good conscience before God. And that comes about when the Holy Spirit begins to live within us. Peter continues here and then he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, this is, these are just long sentences in the Greek. And that's why the ESV just keeps going on and on and on with commas. Some of your versions, like if you have the NIV or you have like the NAL or NLT, New Living Translation, something like that, they're going to break it into small little sentences. But that's not the way it is in the Greek. They're long sentences. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power behind baptism is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is tied to two main things, okay? It's tied to death. And it's tied to resurrection. I don't have this screen, but it just comes to mind. Romans chapter 6. Look at the first part of Romans chapter 6. If we have died with him in a baptism like his, we will be raised to new life. Right? We'll be, we'll be able to walk in the newness of life. I'm not quoting that directly or you know, word for word, but that's the understanding there. Being buried with him in a baptism like his, we're raised to new life. So baptism signifies our death and resurrection spiritually. Not physically, that's yet to come. But that's what it, that's what it um, points to. Luther, Luther beautifully put, he says, The sinner does not so much need to be washed as he needs to die. I love Luther. He's just... You know, you just see him with like a beer in his hand and it's at the pub here. In order to be wholly renewed and made another creature and to be conformed to the death and resurrection of Christ with whom he dies and rises again through baptism. And that's exactly what baptism is about. Death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Right? Right? Colossians chapter 2 also talks about death and resurrection in baptism. It ties it to circumcision, which is, that's a whole other sermon, but that's interesting. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is, the right, and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Jesus can save us and bring us safely through the waters Because he has all power and authority. Just think about that for a moment. Why does Peter end on that? Why does he focus on that? Because it speaks of Jesus' power to judge. As he did once upon a time on this earth through the flood. 
as he judged once upon a time Pharaoh's mighty army, washing them all away with water. And now Jesus can use the waters of baptism to wash away all of that. And to save us from the wrath of God to come. Do you know God's coming back? You know, Jesus is coming back to judge the world. Look at Revelation chapter 19. If you ever have, I mean, you know, don't read it right before bedtime. Whew. He is coming back to judge the world. And he's going to judge the world of sin. It appears not by water, but by fire. Second Peter chapter 3. So, I want to be safely in his ark. How about you? I want to be in his ark? I want to be in his ark. I want to be like those eight who were saved. Now, to be in his ark means to be in Christ. And we come into Christ by placing our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Through being baptized into him. I think another way of seeing his ark is that his ark is his body. Jesus' ark is his body. It's the body of Christ. Right now, you and I, not just here, not just at this particular location, but the church as a whole. We're his, you know, this is his ark. We come in, we're baptized into his body, brought into fellowship with one another, bound together by his Holy Spirit so that we can safely come through the waters because the waters are coming and back, baptism signifies those waters. Those waters are coming to purify the earth and those waters refer to both our cleansing and also the judgment of Almighty God. And we want to be safely in his ark. And we stay safely in his ark as we confess our sins. As we make ourselves right before God. None of us are perfect. We're going to struggle with ourselves until, until we either die and, and go to be with the Lord. Or he comes back in our lifetime. We're going to struggle with ourselves. Things are not going to come out right. We're going to lose control sometimes. That's not an excuse for sin. But it's how we respond to that. Do we come before God and say, Lord, forgive me. As soon as we confess our sins to God, those baptismal waters rush up inside of us and they wash away our sin. And that's why we confess every single day our sins before God. That's why we stay right with God. And we stay in his ark as we prepare for him to return. Amen.